it's Jeff. Hey, Jeff, it's Darren. Hey, how you doing? Hi, how are you? Hold on. Oh, well, thank you very much. A little bit more quiet place. Yeah, sure thing. Where are you calling from? Um, Melbourne, Australia. Oh, where am I calling? Melbourne. Okay, great. Well, I'm here in, uh, where am I? I'm in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil right now. Wow. Coming to you guys like in a few days, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, very soon, almost three years to the day. <laughs> yeah. Just wanted to start by, um, first I need to acknowledge my brother, Adam, who actually handballed over the uh, podcast to me. I'm very happy that he did that. He's on holiday in Thailand. So welcome to the Become a Guitarist Today podcast. It's a pleasure to host you. I've been Great. a fan since uh, the first EP, so it's a, it's a real honor for me. Thank you, Jeff. All right. Nice to be here. Excellent. Now, I heard you um, you just celebrated a birthday. Well, yeah. I've uh, My birthday's on the 14th of January, but it's kind of my tradition to, to celebrate all month long. <laughs> as you do. <laughs> yeah, as you do. <laughs> so what, what here we are. Mean? Yeah, here we are in uh, this incredible restaurant on Copacabana Beach, and uh, we're having a, a little birthday celebration for me tonight. Oh, fantastic. Well, happy birthday and have a drink for me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, last time you were in um, in Melbourne, obviously it was to do Operation Mindcrime 1 and 2 in their entirety. Um, and then, like most Melburnians, that was the last concert we saw before the dreaded lockdown for two years. So... <laughs> I want to, yeah, thank you for leaving us with a good memory. <laughs> yeah, and times have changed, haven't they? It's a, oh, it's a whole new frontier now. Yeah, Absolutely, absolutely. And um, when I, I was lucky enough to go along to, the, to that show and um, I went along expecting amazing vocals and you didn't disappoint. But um, what I didn't expect was uh, such a wonderful, young, energetic band that you had uh, playing. Mm. Was that, yeah. was, was that a deliberate choice to choose uh, younger people to play with you this time around? Well, it wasn't a conscious choice. It just sort of happened like that, you know? Okay. Um, people I've met in the, along the way and um, people that knew other people along the way, it sort of just all kind of happened uh, kind of organically in a sense. Uh, but yeah, I get a, a real kick out of playing with uh, the, the younger guys. They have a, a lot of energy and it keeps me... Uh, I guess kind of pumped up and and uh, able to uh, you know uh, try to keep up with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, they've got great energy, especially that uh, Karen. He seems like a bit of a crazy cat. <laughs> he definitely is that. Definitely is that. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I am thrilled that you're coming back and playing my favorite album of all time, Rage for Order. So I'm very excited to hear that, along with your biggest selling album, Empire. So. Um, yeah, I've been a Rage fan since it came out, the day it came out. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but I went and bought this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's actually Live, a bootleg uh... tape. <laughs> Where was it recorded at? That was recorded in Toronto in 1986. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It still holds up well. It's uh, it's very good for a, for a bootleg cassette, but that was back in the days when the tape trading was going around and... Uh, yeah, had to dig that one out. It was. Um, I'm yeah, I haven't heard. I haven't Sorry. heard that particular one. No. Oh, okay, yeah. it's it's actually it's um, yeah, it's not a bad recording for for its age. So, but um, uh, yeah, and uh, I wonder how it. I wonder how it was recorded. Like, was somebody on a like have a microphone and they just held it up through the show, or is it on the a soundboard, or do you know? I, no, definitely not a soundboard. I, I would say somebody's actually. Uh, Gone in with the old fashioned Walkman, I think, and probably just oh. press play record. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, just an audience uh, typing, but it's that's really cool. It's really cool. I was listening to it last night. So, um, you know, I, I love those kind of uh, tapes and or, or recordings where you hear, you, you, you kind of imagine like this person standing there in the middle of the, of exactly. the room, you know, holding a little microphone for, <laughs> for an hour and a half, two hours or something like that. And, and what they go through because they hear it from their vantage point, right? Yeah. Which, uh, is, is probably considerably different than where the sound engineer hears the, the, the sound or where I hear the sound from where on yeah. the stage. It's totally different. And that's the frustrating thing about being in a band, you know? You can be playing just incredible stuff and it's, it's, it's translated to the audience by one guy and you hope that he has the skill 
in order to translate what it is you're doing yeah. properly. So it has the most effect on people, right? And you give them a framework to work in, which is the recording, you know, on the record. And you say, study this, you know, and uh, you hope that he does that, you know, that, but uh, you're really at the sound man is uh, you're at his mercy, basically, yeah. because you never know as a performer <laughs> how you sound live, right? Exactly. You just don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, I actually um, was back in 1988. I made the uh, the pilgrimage over to Hollywood to immerse myself in the the scene on Sunset Boulevard. And I'll never forget being in a real dive of a motel and I was playing my Rage for Order cassette until it nearly broke. And then there was this station I discovered called KNAC and they played this song and I thought, gee, this sounds like Queensryche, but I don't know the song. And as soon as they finished, they said that was the brand new song from Queensryche called uh, Breaking the Silence. And oh. man, I ran across to Tower Records and picked it up. <laughs> so that was... Uh, ah. Yeah, I was in the right place at the right time because unfortunately in the 80s, Australia seemed to be six months to a year behind the rest of the world when it comes to oh. hearing music. So to be in Hollywood right. when it was released was a real thrill too. So that was great. But um, uh, been, wow. lucky to, been lucky enough to see you uh, perform Mind Crime 1 and 2 twice now, once with Queensryche in Melbourne. And of course, your last two yeah. are here. So, um, yeah, I just want to talk a bit more about Rage for Order being that it is my favourite album. And um, I recently listened to the reissue and got to get close to you, that remix. Whose idea was that? I don't know. I'm going to have to go back and do a little homework and re yeah. familiarize myself with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely, a, it's almost like a techno remix that they did to got to get close to you. It's quite bizarre, actually, but um, oh. that's different. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and what's your? Oh, are you talking about? Are you talking about the extended mix of Rage for Order that was like a, a remix done like in a, uh, I don't know, it kind of had extended beats and stuff to it. Yes, yeah, that's it. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I, I can't, I can't remember whose idea that was. Maybe Chris DeGarmo. I think it was, I think it was DeGarmo's idea. Okay. Yeah, that. Yeah, it puts a whole different spin on the song. <laughs> it does. Yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> And what's your favorite track to play off uh, Rage for Order? Wow, um, I like so many of them. It, it is one of my favorite albums too. And uh, one thing I love about doing this tour is I get to play all the songs, you know, which at the time uh, when we released the album, it was kind of customary to add a couple songs from your new album on the tour, on your set list that you sure. were doing. Yep. So you never really played everything. You just played a couple of new songs, you know, typically, the songs that were your singles, you know, the ones you made videos for and that kind of thing. So um, until the album got big or it took off or people knew it, then you, you played more, but you never played the whole album, you know? So no. uh, I'm really enjoying doing this because I get to play every song. And, and one of my favorite songs, well, I have two, if I could say, favorite, favorite, favorite songs. I mean, I love every song, but I have two that I love playing and that's London. And I love uh, I Dream in Infrared. It's yes. kind of a singer thing, I guess, where you're, you get to emote, you know, as yeah. they say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I agree with you. That's a great, great tracks. But, um, and they're also, they're also, I have to say, probably the most, the two most challenging songs to sing on the record, you know. Okay. They're very right. Yeah. And with Rage for Order, obviously, it's, um, you know, the, the, with the sounds and the keyboards on there. Is that something you reproduce live uh, with triggers and um, backing tapes or? Yeah, we try our best to, to recreate it uh, as the album version, you know? Yeah, right. And uh, yeah, it's now it's okay and easy for us because we're used to it. We've done a few shows like that. But when we first started out, oh, it was tough, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I bet, I bet. But yeah, what's your view on bands using backing tapes uh, these days, especially vocally? Oh gosh, I guess I don't really have a viewpoint. Um, I guess back in my day, we would have called it lip syncing, yeah. you know, yeah. which kind of what, uh, I'll tell you a funny story. When we played, I think at the 1991 or 1992 Grammy Awards, yep. uh, Queensryche, we were, we were up for awards, Silent Lucidity was up for award. And we were the only band that played live and we were, we were flabbergasted because I just assumed 
it was television. It was going to be a live performance by a band that played live, and because that, that's what we did. Yeah. But we were the only one, only ones, and uh, the television production had to make special arrangements for us to play live because they weren't used to that. You know, they were used to bands putting their song up and then lip syncing and dancing yeah. and all that. Exactly. <laughs> so we've, I've always approached it as, you know, this is live and this is what it should be, and it's. It's, you know, it's not album pristine, but it's, you know, we try to get it as close as we can, you know, yeah. with, within our, within the moment, you know, and, uh, and that's what we try to do. That's, that's how we approach it. Excellent. And so you, you definitely don't use any um, lead vocal backing tracks? <laughs> no, never. Excellent. In fact, it's painfully all me. <laughs> <laughs> It's an interesting one. I think a lot of bands, um, you know, dare I say, walk the thin line, pun intended. But <laughs> when it comes to those vocal tracks, you know, when I saw Kiss recently and, you know, Paul obviously used a guiding track on his lead vocal and eh, a little bit disappointing, but what are you going to do with a show like that? <laughs> yeah, I don't think you should use it on a lead vocal ever. I think if you have an effect or something like that, it's a special effect that you, you you can't produce live by some machine and then that's okay but definitely not on a lead vocal no. but then again you know i don't know i i hit it hard i i tour pretty hard as far as keeping my schedule going and i think that makes it better for you as a singer okay. if you take too many off you get i don't know you get lethargic you get lazy if you keep hitting it you're it's approaching it like an athlete would you know, um, your, your, your singing voice is like a, well, you're, you, you approach it like an athletic event, you know, sure. and you train for it. And, uh, yeah. and, and that's, that's the way it should be, I think. That's one man's opinion, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. Did I see recently, maybe even yesterday, you got a new tattoo? <laughs> I did. Yeah. There it is. Have a look at that. Yeah. <laughs> so you started getting tattoos later in life. Well, I did. And, um, you know, I, I figured, uh, what the hell? <laughs> I'm 64 years old. Why not? Why not? I, I might as well. <laughs> I'm not going to go, you know, I'm not going to get a job in a bank <laughs> at this point in my life, you know? <laughs> exactly. Why not? <laughs> and also, uh, you know, I think it's kind of, uh, I don't know. It's something about it is uh, very attractive to record the moment where you're at when you do that, when you mark your body with uh, a symbol or a, a picture that sort of helps you celebrate that moment. You know, uh, I think that's important in life. Something like that. <laughs> that's very nice. <laughs> that must have hurt like hell. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> uh, I need to, I need to try and change it now to be more like your insignia logo. <laughs> <laughs> it's like jeff changed it damn <laughs> really yeah well i got this one uh, recently on my hand and when he did that that one line from from here to here oh my god i thought i was going to lose my mind <laughs> i'd never experienced pain like that before nothing nothing else hurt at all in fact i was unaware of anything really just that one line <laughs> What about the tattoo on the back of your head? That's the way it is. You know, the back of my head, uh, I got a, a pretty large tattoo there. And, yeah. And that, that would have hurt. hurt. Yeah. At all. Yeah. Really? Yeah. It was just uh, annoying, you know, for a few hours. But uh, yeah, the pain level was nothing. Yeah. Okay. And, and my, my uh, tattoo artist said that it's typical that your head doesn't have so many nerves in it, I guess. Okay. And maybe that's a good thing. So exposed yeah. and you're always bumping it into things you know so i guess over time we've evolved and not had a lot of nerve endings there you know yeah right <laughs> now you still got the wine going jeff insania? i am uh yeah for those of you that don't know i have a, a wine brand called insania uh it's made in uh, alsace germany france border right there and uh, we do a pinot gris and a pinot uh noir uh red and a white and uh they're very good and uh they are uh we don't make a lot of wine but we do sell out very fast, so it, uh, it goes quick. Okay, and how would us Aussies get our hands on that? Well, it depends on where you are in the world, um, but uh, our winery does ship, so you can contact them on our on my website or 
my Facebook page, there's typically a little button you can push that says winery or insania and you push the button and it takes you magically i don't know how they do this some kind of wizardry but it takes you to our winery and you can do an order there and they'll send it to you you know okay if okay. they can excellent i'll definitely have to look into that one yeah yeah and your uh backstage travel you still got that going yeah i'm still that that's an incredibly fun part of my life that we get to <laughs> yeah it's uh it's amazing we have one coming up uh Oh, no, I guess it's April. Yeah, it starts in April. Yeah. Is that we the have only one this year? We have one in Italy. We have, well, we have a couple in Italy and we have uh, some in Ireland, Scotland. We have one in Venice, Italy that's uh, coming up. Uh, we have one in Montana, USA. Uh, we have one in France and one in Germany. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Have you ever had any Australians join you? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Well, you got all Looking the forward first. to that first one. Will it be you? Me. <laughs> It'll be all me. <laughs> yeah, it'd be great. Be great. I'm actually looking into a European vacation at the moment. So I might just see if I can get the itinerary to work out. That'd be terrific. <laughs> oh, that'd be cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're they're really fun. They're very oriented towards, you know, where we're at. You know, uh when we're in Scotland, we have uh, I think a couple shows we we along the way during the week. And uh, we do quite a distillery exploration of the different scotch whiskeys as we go along we have a golf trip if you're into golfing uh we have a lot of sightseeing castles uh you name it it's uh sounds great it's quite, quite an endeavor you know yeah it sounds fantastic i'll definitely have to look that one up so <laughs> now i just want to ask you jeff um back in back in the 80s um especially again with australia being a, a little bit behind the world when it comes to um getting music out and definitely bands that toured here we were lucky to get one or two big acts a year so you'd get the right. same crowd going to see twisted sister in 1984 that would go and see ronnie james dio the year later the, the metal crowd sort of just you know they didn't stick to a pocket it was like you had a hard rock metal crowd they went to all the concerts so with that said why did queens um avoid australia for so long well it wasn't a, a matter of avoiding it um we never avoided anywhere we uh we're always dependent upon a promoter that would bring us to uh, the venues yeah. and the city. And, and this, the way the business works, it's, it's like that still, you know, you, you at one point uh, we had a promoter that uh, brought us to Australia and then that promoter went out of business. So we had to develop another relationship oh. with another promoter. And, you know, it, it's like that everywhere you go. Um, it, unfortunately, it's not like, can say oh i'm gonna play in perth today you know and you book a show yeah. you can't do it you have to go through a promoter and an agent and yes. it's a whole chain of people you have to go through you know and when we say people oftentimes write me and they say you know oh would you play you know uh, blank city you know and i say well yeah i'd love to you know there's no place i don't want to play it's yeah. it's uh, can we get there and have a, a show and have a deal you know yep so sure. We try to get everywhere we can, but man, I tell you, it's becoming more and more difficult. So far, I've been to 65 countries around the world. I'm going to go to 66 and 67 and 68 this year, which I'm very excited about. And um, yeah, I'd like to go everywhere I can all the time. And I'm right now, I'm spending like one month out of the year at my own home. <laughs> the rest of the time, I'm on the road traveling. <laughs> Because I'm trying to get everywhere I can, you know. Sure, sure. Uh, the, that's great. Is there anything you're looking forward to seeing in Australia that you haven't done yet? Um, you know, I personally have not been to a beach in Australia. Oh, okay. I've been interior. I've been wine tasting. I've uh, I did a hike through uh, some mountainous area. I've been to zoos and and uh, parks and places where they have you know. Uh, uh, rehabilitated animals, you know, I've been to kangaroo ranches and that yeah. kind of thing. So I'd really like to go to the beach. It's time for the next interview, Jeff. I okay. apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. Apparently I have another interview tonight. <laughs> oh. All right, Jeff, look, I won't hold you up, but thank you so much for your time. Oh, I appreciate it. And and thanks for the interview. I really, really appreciate the interview. Uh, my pleasure, mate. Thank you very much. And we can't wait to see you play Rage for Order and Empire in their entirety. I'll be there. So Look out for me. I'll be the old dude in the crowd. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like me. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Again. Thanks, Jeff. Bye, mate.